renal metastasis or metastatic disease uh, management with an overview of starting with the anatomy of what we're talking about, some imaging, some of the, the way that we look at pain syndromes and a couple of cases at the end. And the general hope is that by the end of this, you get a feel for a little bit of how we tease out who we operate on, why we operate on certain people, um, and kind of just what that algorithm looks like. So without further ado, I'll just start going through it. I have no disclosures, which is fun. So basic stuff that we'll kind of talk about, and I'll kind of highlight this with my mouse, but it's just knowing the anatomy of what we are, what we're talking about all the time, right? So in a very cartoonish way, but also in a, in a solid bony way, the vertebral body is the portion at the front, the spinal cord is in the middle, you've got pedicles on either side, and then the lamina at the back. You can really see that here when you look at this from an axial view where you see vertebral body, the spinal cord live here in the vertebral frame, and it's all hard bone connecting around it, be it the pedicle, the lamina, and the spinous process. And those are kind of the big um, landmarks that we look at. Underneath the pedicle, you can see that here in the in a sagittal view, that's where the nerve root comes out. And that nerve root can be compressed and give you radiculopathy, radicular symptoms. And so a lot of what we'll talk about will deal with the idea of nerve roots coming out here and possible compression from the pedicles due to tumor that's there or disease in the vertebral body in the way that that disease pushes back and actually compresses the spinal cord within the vertebral foramen. So this is just kind of doing the same thing, but looking at it from the standpoint of an MRI. And what you can see is the way that you're built in the lumbar spine and everywhere else in the spine is a bone, a disc, a bone, a disc, a bone, a disc. And then within the lumbar spine, you have the end of the actual spinal cord and then the cauda equina or the free floating nerve roots that are in the sac that kind of go all the way down. When you look at that in an axial, you see the vertebral body in the front, the pedicle along the sides here, and the essentially lamina leading into that. And you have a little bit of a joint as well. Ooh, there's a question in the chat. Oh, that's just for me. Sorry. And so that's the general anatomy of everything that we're talking about when we're looking at films and looking at them at the bedside. And so if you understand that anatomy, you can understand a lot of how we work these people up, how we think about things, but also when we see tumor and we talk about compression, where that really is relating to. And so getting to the idea of compression, you know, the big thing is that we talk about metastatic epidural spinal cord compression grading or Bilski scoring, as some people will call it. And the way it works out is that you've got a range from zero to three, where zero is kind of really isolated to the bone, doesn't come into the canal. A 1A is and 1B are kind of coming into the canal, but not actually compressing the cord. And a 1C gets to a point where you're actually really abutting the spinal cord, but you're not deforming it. A grade two gets to the point where you're actually pushing against the cord, but you still have CSF remaining. And a grade three, you have loss of that CSF signal. So it's really complete loss of that space inside the vertebral frame or the canal, central canal. And then this is what it looks like on MRI. So here at the zero, you see that it's just in the bone right here, but not anywhere else. A 1A, it starts to creep in. A 1B, it's creeping in, but it's not touching the fecal, or the, uh, the, the fecal sac right here, or the spinal cord, sorry. Um, and then when you get to a 1C, you're getting right up to it, but you're not really pushing on it. A two, you're starting to deform and push, and you can see the cord here as it's pushed to the side. And then a three, you really can't see the spinal cord anymore. You have loss of that CSF signal. And that'll become important in a little bit when we start talking about how we think about who needs surgery, who needs radiation, things like that. When it comes to how these patients present, they can present with a combination of things. And so I'll oftentimes on my bedside be talking to patients about biologic pain versus mechanical pain. But the way that I talk about that is biological pain is the pain that you get from the tumor swelling. And it's just your body produces endogenous cortisol or steroids. And as those steroid levels go to their lowest levels overnight, the pain from these tumors becomes its maximal. And people actually will say, you know, I get woken up in the middle of the night from my pain. And then as the morning comes on and into the early morning and like early afternoon, cortisol levels will rise and peak and then start to come back down. But as they are peaking, they get more uh, control of that pain endogenously. And so people who say my pain is worse at night and wakes me up in the middle of the night and better at the start of the morning, that's the biological pain. And that's the type of pain that gets better with radiation and systemic therapy. Radiculopathy deals with that idea of as the nerve roots come out of those different foramen, and you can see the foramen at each of these different levels that are right underneath the pedicle. If it's getting compressed, you can actually get radiating pain that wraps around your chest if it's in the thoracic spine, down the arms if it's in the cervical spine, or down the leg if it's in the lumbar spine. Mechanical pain is all about loading pain. 
And it's different depending on what level you're at. So if you're in the cervical spine, it can be flexion extension type pains. If you're in the thoracic spine, it's really pain when you stand up, but also pain when you lay perfectly flat, because when you're laying flat, you're actually pushing and putting pressure on this thoracic kyphosis. And in the lumbar spine, it's pain that's better when you stand, uh, sorry, when you lay flat, and then worse when you stand up because of how you're loading that pain. And we'll show an example of that at the very end of this talk. And then myelopathy is the thing that most people I think are most familiar with, which is that combination of sensory motor deficits when you have spinal cord compression. And those are people who will tell you, I just can't walk the same way, or my handwriting has been getting progressively worse, just depending on the level that it's at. And so this is just a picture to kind of illustrate what it looks like when you have spinal cord compression. And, you know, the, the classic hallmark pictures are arm and hand weakness, which the subtle finding is, I just can't write the same way that I used to. You get leg weakness. Other people who just say, you know, they, they're full strength when you do a direct confrontational exam, but when you have them actually try to stand and walk, they cannot do it. Um, hyperreflexia winds up being typically a more longer term thing as someone who's had it for a period of time to be able to develop that symptom. And you can also have bowel and bladder dysfunction. It'll be fecal incontinence where they don't know that it's happened. And then the urinary incontinence is typically an overflow incontinence because they're no longer able to fully void. And so they're actually retaining urine. And a lot of times what you'll do is you'll have someone spontaneously void and then do a bladder scan and you'll see that they're retaining a liter of urine. And that's a sign that they have urinary dysfunction or bladder dysfunction. And then you can have a sensory level. So people who have a T6 lesion will oftentimes have a lesion somewhere in the T6 level, so somewhere below the nipple line, or if it's a T10, somewhere near the umbilicus, but those sensory levels are, are helpful for localizing uh, the actual offending level. You can see here in the cartoon picture just what it looks like when you really have this epidural tumor going posteriorly and pushing on the spinal cord, and then this image should actually be inverted just to make sure that this is the posterior aspect, this is the anterior aspect, this is the bone, and then the tumor that's kind of coming and compressing the spinal cord. And the reason that we care so much about early detection, teasing out these symptoms is because if you catch people before they completely lose the ability to walk, you have a higher likelihood of regaining the ability of re regaining that ability or maintaining that ability. When people have been out for 48 hours, the chance of them recovering a lot of that function really do go down significantly. And so when we talk about treatment goals for these people, it really is restoring or maintaining their neurologic function, taking care of their pain and their pain syndromes, alleviating their spinal stability. And the reason it's an asterisk there is because in people, for people who deal with trauma a lot, these tumor patients are not unstable the same way a trauma patient is. With a trauma patient, you need to have them in a brace, allow them to fixate and fuse in place or put in rods and screws to, do, to, to give that stability back. But without that, they're at risk of injuring their spinal cord or progressing their fracture. Whereas in these cancer patients, they're not unstable in that way. They're really unstable in the sense that they have abnormal degrees or amounts of motion that are impacting the, 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 uh, they're really impacting the way that their bones are communicating such that they're creating pain syndrome, but they're not at risk of falling over or falling forward the same way as someone with a cervical burst fracture might be. And it's a lot of this is preserving quality of life. These surgeries are palliative in nature when we do them. And when we try to do separation surgery to get people onto definitive radiation and systemic therapy, it's really about trying to prevent local recurrence in these situations. And then this is the gnomes paradigm. So this is a lot of how we look at the spine oncology patient as a whole. And it really tries to break it down to the neurologic, the oncologic, mechanical, which is the stability aspect and the systemic disease. The neurologic part of this really is a combination of radiology plus symptoms. It's does the patient have radiculopathy? Do they have a focal motor deficit or do they have signs of myelopathy? And to what degree are they compressed based on that Bilski grading or that epidural spinal cord compression grading? The oncologic part of it deals with um, the type of tumor. So certain tumors like lymphomas are very radiation sensitive, whereas other tumors like renal cell carcinoma or kidney cancers are much more radiation resistant. And that has impacts on the different treatment options from a radiation standpoint we may offer or how much room we need to give the radiation oncologist to be able to treat them. And then it's also talking about what are the systemic options. If you have melanoma and you have a BRAF mutation, you have a lot more systemic options than someone who doesn't have that same mutation. Mechanical stability factors in because even if someone is a good radiation candidate who doesn't need separation surgery, if they're mechanically unstable and have that type of pain, they still warrant a surgical intervention to palliate their pain because the radiation won't impact that. 
And the systemic disease arm is really one of the most critical parts because as much as we can offer someone surgery based on the N, the O, and the M, if they are so systemically progressed or sick that they really can't tolerate a procedure or that it's not really medically advisable, it obfuscates the other end of this. It really is the most important part of can someone tolerate what we're about to do and can they live long enough to gain benefit from what we we're about to do for them. And again, that's another showing of that whole of the, essentially the grading, but it gets back to the whole, this is really, really important from the, the, the neurologic end of it, because people who are these 1As, 1Bs, and 1Cs, they're going to be intact. People who are the 2s are probably also going to be intact. You may see, depending on where it is, some of the ridiculous symptoms, but the grade 3s are going to be the people that are really coming in symptomatic. And the boundary between a grade 2 and a grade 3 when you're looking at an MRI is not always clear, but it raises your level of suspicion that someone may need surgery. But it also gets to the idea that when you do have these low levels of compression, we can treat you with upfront radiation. Versus when you have these grade twos and grade threes, typically if it's radio sensitive, we can get you through with radiation alone if in the absence of mechanical instability. But if you are radio resistant, like the renal cells, um, you do need to create room for people. And this is just a paper just showing that it's kind of been parsed out what the radio sensitive, radio resistant ones are. Breast and prostate, as well as lymphoma, seminoma, and myeloma, fall into that radio sensitive. And so for lymphoma, seminoma, and myeloma, those don't really get surgery typically ever unless you really have to for a stability type of an issue. Breast and prostate are somewhere in the middle where we've actually here been pushing it in for the grade three or the high grade compressions with prostate, putting them on high dose steroids and also providing them with radiation quickly, kind of in an urgent or emergent fashion, and are seeing results with, with that. But for the sarcomas, melanomas, renal cells, non-small cells, and GI tumors, they're really radio resistant. They need more of that space. And once you give them that space, they can actually get good high dose radiation treatments. Yeah. And really the reason that we can do all this kind of fancy better radiation is because we have more conformal radiation. And so the big thing here is just, you know, because I'm not a big radiation expert, but I know that it's, it's helpful, I think, to see what we've used to do and what we've gotten to. And so historically, you know, spine external beam radiation therapy, which is what we still do for some people who have those very radiation sensitive tumors, it's a broad field, a lot of involved um, area. But when you think about spine SBRT or that stereotactic body radiation therapy or spine stereotactic radio, so there's a bunch of different names for it. What you're really doing is giving a very conformal dose to the actual involved area and you're giving a very high dose. When you're giving a wide field like this, you can't give 24 gray in one fraction versus when you have a very conformal dose being delivered to a single vertebral body level, you can actually give a very high conformal dose that's ablative and gets good local control. And so that's why we do the separation surgery because we also have to worry about the spinal cord dose and what the nerves are receiving because that can also cause complications if it's too close and we can't give a good enough dose. <laughs> when it comes to the mechanical assessment arm of this, this is a, the spinal instability neoplastic score. And it was developed originally for primary care physicians and oncologists to be able to kind of classify how unstable someone likely was to help triage them to either IR or neurosurgery or kind of help them to understand where someone should go. We still use this ourselves. Um, to some degree, it lines up with what we intuitively think, but I think it can be helpful in terms of the scores that it puts out and understanding how unstable someone probably is or the likelihood that they have mechanical instability. And the scores range from zero to 18 with the lower scores not requiring surgical stabilization and the higher scores being very indicative of probably requiring stabilization due to lack of stability. And this intermediate level, it's more that you just need to be assessed because some people who are a score of a 10 or a nine may need something and other ones actually very well may not may get by just with the radiation treatment. And the way to look at this is it looks at location pain, the quality of the lesion, spinal alignment, body, vertebral body collapse, and whether or not the posterior elements are involved. And so when it comes to location, the easy way to think about this is that things that don't have ribs are less stable. So if you're in these junctional areas of the occiput down to C2 and even C7 to T2, where you, there are these areas of transition, they're very, very mobile. And they're mobile areas that in this, in the cervical thoracic and in the thoracolumbar area, they're mobile areas that then transition into very fixed areas. And they wind up being some of the most mobile parts of the spine or areas where you have lots of instability. The mobile spine is places where you, you don't really have any bony attachments or attachments to the sacrum, like C3 to C6 or L2 to L4. 
the semi-rigid spine really is the mid portion of the thoracic spine from T3 to T10. And because it has bracing from the ribs, it actually winds up being very solid. And then the rigid spine is a lower sacrum from S2 to S5. When it comes to pain, a lot of what we're trying to tease out is, is this mechanical pain? And that's that whole thing we talked about before where people who say, I lay flat, I feel great. I sit up, I feel terrible. Or, you know, I lay at an angle like this. I sit up, I feel terrible or try to walk. I feel terrible. That's that mechanical pain. And it's always trying to tease out, is the pain mechanical or is it not mechanical? Because if it's not mechanical and it's a biological type of a pain, that just needs radiation and steroids help with those things. It's all calming down the inflammation. When it comes to the quality of the lesion, lytic lesions get two points because they're actually erosive of the bone and destabilizing. Lesions that are blastic actually can cause sclerosis in the area <clears throat> or kind of reinforcement of the bone. So they're not as unstable as the other ones. And then you have a lot of lesions that can be mixed and have areas of lytic and blastic um, nature. When it comes to the alignment, it's just really a question of do we have a deformity that's been induced by the fracture? Subluxations and translations we don't see very often, but they can happen. Most of what we see are focal kyphoses that come due to a compression fracture or a vertebral planum compression fracture, secondary to a, a spinal metastasis. And then we look at how much collapse we have and how much vertebral body collapse we have, or sorry, body involvement. And if you have a large degree of collapse, aka greater than 50%, that's highly indicative of, of being likely to have painful syndromes versus less than 50%, or someone who's got no collapse with a lot of vertebral body involvement. And the posterior element part of this really gets to the idea of the mechanical instability, because if you really have disease that goes into the pedicles, you find that those people oftentimes have a lot of instability pain because as they stand and load, the communicating portion between the anterior and posterior columns of the spine winds up being incompetent. I'll say, does anybody have any questions so far? I know I'm going a little bit through this. Right. Um, nope, nothing in the chat. Okay, perfect. I'll keep going. Um, so when it comes to the mechanical assessment, we've said this before, but radiation does not impact spinal stability. And so it's its own independent indication for intervening. And, and someone who you see a film like this, you can look at it and you can say, okay, like there is compression of the spinal cord, right? This is probably going to be a grade two, if not a grade three, depending on what it looks like on an actual axial cut. But you can see that you've got greater than 50% loss of height. You may have some posterior element involvement as well. You're in the semi-rigid, uh, in the rigid spine. And so you're probably gonna have a SIN score that's somewhere between 10 and 14 is my guess, just ballparking it. But your indication for surgery here are gonna be A, <coughs> need for decompression to actually radiate this person and give them definitive therapy. But B, they're probably gonna also have some mechanical instability. So you'll probably be treating both at the same time. This just gets to that diurnal cortisol rhythm that we were talking about where, you know, in the, if you go towards the evenings, and overnight, you have your lowest levels. And as you start waking up in the morning, your cortisol levels get higher. And that's kind of correlates with biological pain. And since we're seeing that you've got your highest levels of pain at night and your lowest levels in the morning, correlating with when you have your highest levels of your, of your uh, endogenous steroids. And this is just more of an explicit laying out of the different pain regions. And so in the cervical spine, <coughs> you can see pain with rotation or with that flexion extension because you do have a lot of mobility in that area. In the thoracic spine, it really is that extension or straightening of the unstable kyphosis kind of pushing against this kyphotic curve that creates pain for people. So those are the ones that they get pain with laying flat. They're better with sitting in a recliner and they're then worse when they try to stand up and load this. Versus in the lumbar spine, they love laying flat or putting a little wedge or a pillow underneath their low back and they get worse when they actually stand up and try to walk. The systemic assessments, all the things that we've talked about in terms of it's looking at age, comorbidities, it's looking at, you know, their systemic disease burden and how they're doing overall. And the bottom line is we are terrible at actually predicting this. And so a lot of attention has been paid to trying to create predictive models of 30 day, 90 day and one year mortalities um, based on just retrospective data. And so one of these is the SOAR nomogram, which I think Bilski and Laufer helped with um, validating here, but it comes out of Mass General. It takes into account your tumor histology, your ECOG status, whether or not you actually have a, um, a neurological deficit, so using age score for that. Do you have any signs of visceral metastases, other metastases, and the, a few different um, other factors, like what's your BMI, what's your platelet count, things that they found through kind of their own retrospective uh, analysis of patients to be predictive of, <coughs> excuse me, of outcomes. And then once you're done with it, you can go to the website, you click here, and it'll actually spit out 
the following graph where you can see the likelihood of 90 day mortality, the likelihood of one year mortality and all these types of things. And it's actually very nice. And so it'll say here, probability of 90 day survival is 7%. And it can be a very helpful way of just gestalting <coughs> is someone really sick, even though medicine's saying they're cleared for surgery. And then this is just laying out a little bit of the GNOMES framework where people who have that low grade epidural spinal cord compression and no myelopathy, it breaks down and then into are they radio sensitive or radio resistant? And if they're radio sensitive and mechanically stable, you can just radiate them. Of course, if they're unstable, you're always going to be stabilizing them. The real picture here that pops up is when they're high grade epidural spinal cord compression, then you actually start needing to have discussion about decompression and stabilization for different things when they're radio resistant pathology. And, but it's also emphasizing that when you do have that high grade, if they are radio sensitive, external beam radiation is still reasonable. You can do it upfront. You can do it urgently to emergently to try to get them through without requiring surgery, unless they're unstable. And so the, really the thing I'm hammering home on here is patient presentation and spinal stability dictate all the treatment paradigms of what you can offer someone. And I think that's what that last slide really shows is that, you know, if you're unstable, you need surgery, even no matter what your radiation indication is. If you're mechanically stable, then you can have a conversation about, can we just radiate them or do they need a separation surgery to, to essentially create a target that's safe for radiation? The other half of this is how we do the surgery. And the big thing here, is not necessarily that the charts that are here, this is the Patchell study. And this happened in 2005. And it's important because it really fundamentally shifted how we looked at the surgical indications for metastatic epidural spinal cord compression. Prior to 2005, all we really had was conventional external beam radiation therapy. People didn't live very long. And so, and people had bad outcomes from surgery. Laminectomy alone caused a lot of iatrogenic deformity and people didn't do well. And so the running assumption from places like Sloan Kettering and across the country and the world, that there's no role for surgery, just get them onto radiation and what happens will happen. It's, a, it's kind of a terminal disease picture. <clears throat> but what they did in 2005 out of Tennessee was they actually did a randomized controlled trial and showed that if you give people surgery plus conventional radiation, as opposed to just conventional radiation, you had higher rates of maintaining ambulation, return to ambulation and better quality of life, better maintenance of bowel and bladder function. And so that really shifted the paradigm where we all started doing a lot more surgery for spinal metastatic disease. The big shift in a lot of this stuff was going from large construct surgeries where you see here a corpectomy cage to do a gross total resection, plus a long four above, four below construct, which is fairly morbid, lots of blood loss, and takes a lot of time for patients to recover from to trying to go smaller and smaller. Because when you're losing a liter and a half of blood or to two liters in someone who's systemically very ill, a high risk of wound complications, you're delaying the time that it takes for them to get onto radiation therapy. But also, if you get them the radiation therapy, there's a higher risk that that wound can break down even at one point and then interrupt their systemic therapy or their radiation therapy. And then you've really undone whatever progress you've made. And so this is just a little bit of a look at what separation surgery actually looks like. And you can see us here, we're just drilling and removing some of the lamina to get down. And that's the drill going there, screws on either side. And we're removing the lamina up and below. You can see the spinal cord here. And we actually reach beneath the fecal sac where the spinal cord lives and really depress that down to be able to really reconstitute the fecal sac and be able to see that right here. But that's what it looks like in the OR. It really is laying out the entirety of the fecal sac across the area where we believe that there's compression and then reaching anteriorly and really pushing down and trying to recreate that signal so that when you get your myelogram post-op for our simulations, you can actually see CSF anteriorly and posteriorly. And here you can see the laminectomy defect. And so when it comes down to open surgical decompression and stabilization, long segment constructs it's, were nice because we realized we, we didn't need to do corpectomy anymore because the SBRT and other uh, adjuncts obfuscated the need for that, which made for less blood loss, less morbidity, simpler approaches and shorter hospitalizations. But having to go long like this because people with cancer have very poor bone quality still left the issue of a long incision that they had to heal before they could get on to their actual definitive treatment. And so the big thing that changed that, excuse me, was the use of cement augmentation. Essentially, you can see here a regular screw on the left, and then on the right, you can see a screw that we've actually put cement through. And 
There's lots of different screws. There are screws that put cement out through the tips. There are screws that put cement out through the entirety of the, um, of the actual screw. <clears throat> but what this did was allowed for decreased screw pullout by maintaining them in place like right uh, where they are. But also, it, if you put enough cement in, you can almost create a kyphoplasty-like effect. But that increased spring plot, which you can see here through these partially fenestrated and fully fenestrated screws, what, it, what you see is that it's so much better than a non-augmented screw. But now if we have better screw pullout, we don't need to go two or three levels above to be able to have more stability to these constructs. What we're actually able to do is go smaller, which is a lot of the constructs that you see us making here where we're going one up and one down, cementing through those screws and they're really holding. And so this is what you see. And so if you think about it in your mind, you compare the, the previous uh, set of images where we had screws going, you know, several levels up and several levels down to now you have an incision that's just spanning three levels and still actually holding is still quite stable. And you can see you can still get the same level of decompression. Fecal sac is reconstituted and you can treat this with radiation. <laughs> and then the way to think about why going smaller and kind of doing this even percutaneously, which was the next iteration of this is good, is because instead of having to splay open and dissect off all the muscle and all the fascia to be able to get an opening, we can now make smaller incisions, which you can see in the bottom area, uh, bottom uh, depiction, that allow us to, in a shorter amount of time with less blood loss, less uh, incision size, and honestly less pain, achieve the same goals of stabilization. The big trade-off though is that it's a longer OR setup. It's a lot more instrumentation and we no longer can visualize directly the anatomy that we're operating on. It's just another slide of what it looks like in the actual operating room where we're putting these in. And so you can see here, you know, you'll see a lot of these uh, tubular retractors that are tubes that are in that are sitting over the actual screw heads. And then we can actually thread a rod underneath the skin to connect it up without having to make a bigger incision. And then if you look here in the bottom left, that's us showing the fact that you can actually drop a tubular retractor in conjunction with this and then decompress areas of the spinal cord in a minimally invasive fashion. And what you can see when you actually take a look down the microscope doing these surgeries, you can see a spinal cord, you can see nerve roots played out, and you can do this in the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and in the lumbar spine, all to the same effect of decompressing the areas where you have tumor that needs to be relieved from uh, a neural structure. And then I think this is the, the slide that I think drives home really the benefit of going minimally invasive for doing these types of things is that with traditional open surgery, you're large and splayed out. You have a lot of screws above, a lot of screws below. When we went short segment, it's a smaller incision. This is zoomed in a lot more, but it still is splaying on or spreading all of this off of the midline, dissecting the muscle. And we get to the minimally invasive approach. You can do, this is something I did for a trauma, but you can actually just have these small little incisions that are right lined up, up and down. And then two above, two below, put the screws in, and those are a lot easier to heal. And I think that's here in the patient that I had where, you know, if you have, this is not mine, but if you have a traditional open surgery, you start breaking down one part, you're fixing the entirety of this. You're not going to necessarily get local control versus with a minimally invasive approach. If everything else heals, but you have a little bit of a local issue here, you can do local wound care, or you can just uh, you know, open an IND this one area without having to worry about necessarily revising all of the hardware, which I think is a big benefit in people who you're trying to get onto radiation and systemic therapy. And so I think another thing to look at is, you know, we went from having these long constructs and to having these smaller things, smaller incisions, but the reality is that we traded off having a very simple OR for having a lot more stuff in the actual operating room where we now have entire sets of trays and decks of trays that are de devoted to actually being able to do these procedures. And so it's led to increased complexity in the operating room, but a decrease in the actual, I think, morbidity and the size of the uh, wound to heal for the patients. But at the same time, not everything that's new is great. And we do have some shortcomings to the short segments. And when we do have failures, what you'll see is that they are failures like this where the screw rods are actually breaking off at the tulip heads because they're so well cemented in that they'll fracture this way. And when that happens, we then have to go in and do longer construct fixes. There's not a high rate of these, but it is something where it's not a perfect system. It's a part of ongoing research is trying to figure out the biomechanics of when we need to go longer because short is not appropriate for every single patient, but it is, it does work well for a lot of patients. And so just to do like a couple of patient presentations, just to kind of drive home the idea of what we're talking about. Um, 
I was going to, I was hoping I'd be in person so I could actually kind of like walk you guys through and have you guys answer some of this, but I'll just run through them um, and just fill in gaps here. But this is a 55 year old guy, newly diagnosed with liver cancer as a solitary L3 retrieval body met and liver and uh, liver primary. And that's it. Um, comes in because he's having progressively low back pain whenever he's standing or sitting up, which fits with the lumbar spine, right? We talked about this lumbar spine, you lay flat, you feel great. You stand up, try to walk, you're loading that lumbar spine, you get terrible intractable pain and he's neurologically intact. And so the big question is, what do you want to do with this? I think A is you kind of figure out, do you think it's operative or not? Um, and that's through going through kind of our whole gnomes paradigm. We'll do that in the next slide, right? So if we go through the gnome, so neurologic, he's motor intact, but he's high grade for the compression. From an oncologic standpoint, he's got a patocellular carcinoma and he is radio, which is radio resistant. It's not in that radio sensitive category, it's radio resistant. Mechanically, if we look at his SIN score, you can see that here, you know, this is located in the mobile spine, right? It's in, at L3. This is, he does have mechanical pain. So he gets three points for that. The lesions are lytic. Um, it's easier to appreciate that on CT scan, which isn't shown here, but it's a lytic lesion. And when it comes to the alignment, he is normally aligned. And he has no collapse of the vertebral body, but he does have greater than 50% involvement. And he has bilateral involvement of the posterior elements. And let me see what you can, you can see that here when you see that there's tumor extending back into the pedicle this way and near complete obliteration of the pedicle on this side. And here you can see it's greater than 50% involvement, but he really doesn't have significant collapse there. And from a systemic standpoint, he's newly diagnosed, he's otherwise healthy, he's oligometastatic with no other medical comorbidity, so he's a good surgical candidate. And you see your SIN score gives you an 11, which is technically an indeterminate score or needs further assessment, but he kind of fits in that mechanically unstable category when you really think, when you listen to the pain that he is describing. And so we wound up doing, because liver cancer or hepatocellular carcinoma is very, very bloody and tends to bleed a lot, we actually did a preoperative embolization of the tumor. You can see some of that here with the uh, embolisate that's, uh, that's uh, kind of casted one of the vessels leading into it. And then we actually did a short segment fusion from L2 to L4. We did this open because we really need to really decompress the fecal sac to help them have a target. And then we cemented the screws and you can see how the cement looks kind of coming through the screws here and here, as well as here and here. And if you look on the lateral view, you can see cement through the screw on that side and cement through the screw on, on this side as well. And then once we did that, um, connected him in, decompressed him, doing the embolization made it very not bloody. We only lost about 250, 300 cc's of blood in doing this, but he had such excruciating uh, mechanical instability pain that when we actually fixated him, even though he had muscle spasms and other things, he wanted to go home the day after surgery because you really are trading a really debilitating pain for a less debilitating type of pain, but a different kind of a pain. And this is filmed from about a year. I think it was about a year, a year and a quarter out. And you can see the screws are still holding in place. He, the vertebral body has not collapsed any further. And he has good sense of reconstitution of the, uh, the fecal sac here. And he actually did really, really well. Um, he's now about a year and a half to a year and three quarters out. And he's still doing well, has gotten a systemic therapy and has no signs of progression of disease. But also with going small like this, getting him to his SBRT two to three weeks after surgery, we did it with no problems and no wound breakdown issues. The other one that I think is a good one to look at is this one, which is a 55 year old woman who has metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, um, who come with progressive thoracic pain. It increases at night, um, but uh, doesn't worsen with position changes, improves when she lays flat but there's no exacerbation of the pain with walking, right? So we're describing a biological type of a pain with that picture. And if you look at this, and we'll look at it on the next slide as well, is that you can see that it looks like it's isolated to the vertebral body. Doesn't look like it has much posterior element involvement. Doesn't look like it actually has much involvement of the, or compression of the fecal sac there either. So if we do the gnomes assessment, right? She's an ESCC grade zero. Doesn't really extend into the fecal sac. From an oncologic standpoint, she's an EGFR mutant, which I didn't mention there, but for her lung adenocarcinoma, but she's also radio resistant. Mechanically, she's a score of a four, right? She's semi-rigid spine, the middle of the spine, or middle of the thoracic spine. She has occasional pain, but it's not mechanical, really. She has biological pain. The lesion is a mixed lytic and blastic on the CT scan that she has. 
she's normally aligned if we look at that, right? She has normal, nice thoracic curvature. It's not uh, an exacerbated kyphosis. And the retrieval body really isn't collapsed, but more than 50% of it is involved and there's no involvement of the posterior element. So she's a SIN score of four, which fits what we would think about her from her story of biologic pain predominantly in that she's not necessarily gonna need stabilization for mechanical instability. And systemic wise, good control, no significant medical comorbidities. And so when it comes to what do you do for her, she wound up getting SBRT with 27 gray and three fractions. <clears throat> and at four years out, she has not had recurrence or any other issues from it. But I think that's a general whirlwind overview of everything. I went through it a little bit quickly because I know I came in late, um, but that's my approach to kind of metastatic oncology the workup of the patient, how I look at them and how 